Here, we have an optimal radar return with a few different targets. It'd be awesome if they actually looked like this because we could easily just say these are targets 1, 2, and 3 and be done with it. But in reality, these targets have widths that depend on a number of factors and there ends up being noise from a multitude of sources like thermal noise, other emitters, and lots of others. So with imperfect data like this, how do we actually determine which peaks are our targets and which should just be included in the noise? Well, one solution would just be to set a static threshold. Everything above the threshold we say is a target and everything below we say is noise. We're done, right? Well, this should actually be classified as noise and this should be classified as a target. So with this technique, we can play around with the threshold value and maybe get something optimal, but you quickly run into the problem of overfitting to your training data, and when you try it with a new set of samples, it may not work as well. But let's go back to our original signal. So what we need is a dynamic threshold that updates based on the target's surroundings to classify the different parts of our radar's return. By the way, this example dynamic threshold is literally just a low-pass filter applied to the range spectrum with an offset, which is another dynamic threshold option, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Let's instead try out a technique called CIFAR, or Constant False Alarm Rate. It gets this name because it computes a threshold for each of these ranges individually, such that the probability of classifying a range as a target or noise incorrectly, also known as the probability of false alarm, remains constant across the entire range of whatever you're measuring over, like distance or velocity, hence the name Constant False Alarm Rate. Okay, so how do we compute this? Well, we're doing this in the digital domain, so this is really a collection of amplitude samples. Let's first make these samples over range into cells that each contain an amplitude value. So we have a0, a1, a2, and so forth. Then we'll first pick a random cell to compute the threshold for. What we choose doesn't matter, as we'll eventually repeat this for all the cells. Real quick though, for all the CIFAR parameters I'm about to introduce, I'll talk more about how you choose their values in a minute, and in the description is a Python notebook where you can play around with the values yourself. This is our cell under test, or CUT, but some people also call it the cell of interest. We then want to include a few cells surrounding the CUT, called the gap cells, that will be ignored in the threshold calculation. The reason for this is that the target has some width, like I talked about in the beginning of the video, and if we didn't include the gap, the target's width outside of what's included in the CUT would influence its own threshold, which we don't want. So we add this gap with a cell count that depends on how big we expect the targets to be and how fine our range resolution is. Then outside those gap cells, we take several cells as the reference cells, and these are what we actually use for the computation. Now, there's a few things we could do with the reference cells, but a common technique we'll talk about is the aptly named cell averaging technique. With this, we take the reference cell values and get their average or mean. We then take this average value and multiply it by a bias, which determines how much wiggle room you want to give your targets before dropping below and being classified as noise. And there you have your cylinder test's personalized threshold. But before we repeat this over all the cells, let's go back to the plot to show what this really looks like. Again, we have the cylinder test, the gap cells, and now the reference cells. We can take these reference cells and average their amplitudes, then take that average and multiply it by the bias. As you can see, this is what determines how strict the threshold is. This thing gives us a threshold, and look, the cylinder test amplitude is above the threshold, so it must be a target. Now, this process can be swept across all the cells to get a complete dynamic threshold. Right here, we're creating this blue line by looking at each of the cells under test and computing the mean of their respective reference cells. Then, we take that, and a bias is applied to the whole averaged line. And there we have our threshold over the whole range spectrum. Again, everything above we classify as a target, and everything below is noise, clutter, and whatever else we don't care about. Pretty easy, right? Now that you know how it works, let's jump back and talk about the actual design process, or how you choose the values for the gap cells, reference cells, and the bias. And just as a reminder, you can follow along in the Python notebook in the description. First, you have complete control over how many gap cells you use. This may depend on how large of targets you expect, like detecting a plane versus a human. So in the example of a plane, the targets on this red line would be wider, so you might want to choose more gap cells. 
But in the example of a human, the targets would be narrower, and fewer gap cells would probably suffice. And you may have to play around with this some, but there's also some resources in the description that provide some more definitive ways to determine this. Then, the bias again determines how strict you want the classification threshold to be, which will depend on your signal-to-noise ratio, also in the description. So if we raise it high, the chance of misclassifying noise as a target goes down, but the chance of misclassifying a target as noise goes up too, and vice versa for decreasing the bias. And then, of course, you can also define how many reference cells you want to use. So if we increase this to a large number, it starts to look more like a low-pass filter was applied to the whole spectrum, but if we keep it small, it doesn't take into account much of the CUT's surroundings. Also, you have the option of using something other than the simple cell averaging technique that we used in this video. A couple other options include the greatest technique, where only the cells on the side of the CUT with the greatest mean amplitude are considered. Or the similar but opposite smallest technique, which does the same thing but uses the side with the smaller mean amplitude. And there's even more that I won't cover here, but you can read about them in the description. Even with these different design knobs and techniques, this isn't a perfect detection algorithm. I mean, no algorithm is really a perfect detection algorithm, unless you know before the fact where the targets are, in which case why are you even using a radar, but it has a relatively simple implementation with pretty good results which makes it a popular choice and is therefore pretty important to know about. Thank you so much for watching. As always, there's resources, caveats, and all the source code for this video is in the description. If you want to see more stuff like this about radar and RF engineering, definitely subscribe, tell me if there's anything that you thought wasn't clear in the comments, and give it a like if you liked it. Also, tell me in the comments what you'd like me to cover next.